Uh, Deputy Chair uh, Josephine Bartley, thank you so much for uh, handling uh, my usual job in the morning and doing so outstandingly well. Round of applause. <laughs> no, it's, um, thank you. Um, and I'm sure we've got a lot of satisfied local boards uh, who have managed to air their case, um, and we'll listen to that. Thank you. Um, members will now go to item nine, that's the downtown car park strategic tra transport outcome, so I'll move accordingly. Mayor, would you second? I would be happy to second that. And the Mayor will second, so that's on the table. Um, members, we've canvassed this on a number of occasions last year at Planning Committee, um, Council of Simpsons Finance and Performance Committee, uh, where the general direction to look at disposal was undertaken. Um, we've um, uh, now we've since looked at planning committee at um, a range of strategic outcomes, excluding the transport outcome. We came back to planning committee uh, of recent, um, and we were not satisfied with uh, uh, the the direction of travel. So we adjourned that item. Um, and are picking it up today. A lot of work's been done in between, and I'm confident now from reading the report and uh, doing the work behind the scenes uh, and talking to a lot of other parties that it's landing well. I will now hand over to Ross Chernside. I welcome um, David Rankin, the Chief Executive of Ekepanuku as well. Um, I, is it in David's hands? David. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you've just noticed, uh, noted, <laughs> Um, last December, we came to the Planning Committee uh, with advice of a strategic opportunity to uh, progress one of the initiatives in the City Centre Master Plan being the redevelopment of the downtown car park site. I think it's important to um, note, as I did at the first workshop, that <clears throat> the opportunity wasn't the result of some careful and sequenced work programme. Uh, because obviously it came about uh, because of the unsolicited bid, which we judged to be highly credible, and which for the first time showed us that there was serious interest in the site for a redevelopment rather than just for continuing to use the site in this prime part of the city centre for parking. It, because it wasn't part of a uh, work program, the point I made at the first workshop was that if we, want to, if we wanted to seize this strategic opportunity which had been presented, which uh, we, we arguably should, then we needed to focus as a group on the bigger and more important outcome decisions that we wanted from the redevelopment of the site knowing that there will be a huge amount to work through afterwards in a logical sequencing. In saying that, however, um, it is our view that we all now have sufficient clarity of the issues to enable the governing body responsibly to make the big calls which are needed. And indeed, as the Chair has just noted, most of the outcomes and the key decision to take the site to the market for redevelopment was made pre-Christmas. And all we're really left with is the transport outcomes. <clears throat> this approach I've just talked about of sequencing and working our way methodically and in a logical way through the masses of detailed issues that will come with any of these, um, that come with any of these big complex projects realistically acknowledges that really to meaningfully address higher, greater levels of detail and answer the myriad of questions which arise involves significant time, cost and effort, which logically should follow the big decisions being made by the group and most importantly by the governing body. I'd also um, strongly suggest to councillors that that sort of work most productively and usefully for the best outcome should be done with the development partner that we will be eventually entering into a development agreement with. 
us continuing to spend huge amounts of time and, frankly, money on design work options and all the other things without working with the other party that's doing the rest of the development that will be beside and all around this um, is the very definition of unproductive work. We're literally stumbling around in a room with one hand tied behind our back. And any kind of understanding of best practice with public sector um, significant complex development projects is that the best outcome is working almost on a co-design basis with the quality partner rather than trying to do our own thing for a year or more, spending a lot of money on designs and then having to throw half of it out. The important thing is to be clear on the important things that you want from this redevelopment. Now, the process of uh, workshopping, debate, council questions and feedback that we've had since last December has, in my view, been very helpful in clarifying and progressing thinking on the transport outcomes required. And so where we are, as summarised by the report you've got today, um, is ready to focus on three key transport issues. The first is the requirement for a flexible multimodal transport hub of around 3,000 square metres to support public access to micro-mobility, including end-of-journey facilities, mobility parking, micro-freight distribution hub, <laughs> uh, and similar. The second uh, key issue is that um, instead of prescribing a minimum number of short-stay public car parks, we will simply indicate to the market that we are specifically seeking proposals on that as part of their overall package. And we say that with uh, a level of confidence that we know that players will be presenting numbers of short-stay public car parking. The third thing which is dealt with in the report and is really the main focus of the report is the bus facility. Now, the report is really making three key points about the bus facility. The first is that it articulates better than you've uh, had before from us the fact that there is a bus problem <clears throat> and that that bus problem is going to keep growing given the Council's strategic commitment to continuing to grow as much as we can passenger transport into the city centre as the primary means of people coming here and as part of our commitment to address the challenge of climate change. So frankly, the big order decision today about the bus facility is, do you want to use this process, this opportunity, to help solve the bus problem? It won't solve it by itself, but the report is arguing clearly a material contribution to a real problem. Then the second thing, <clears throat> is that the report is presenting two concepts that, based on our work, could help address that bus problem. The first we've described as on-site, which really amounts to the bus facility being either at level one or basement. And from the work we've done, for various reasons, we don't think the ground uh, floor uh, option is uh, worth pursuing. The second of the two concepts, which is new to compared to previous workshops, but again has come out of the work and all considering your feedback and more interaction with other key players, is that we look at taking this opportunity to remove the Lower Hobson flyover, which is also a city centre master plan initiative, and use that space as part of the answer to the bus problem. 
effectively, if you like, we will end up with the space being used by buses, but it will be a very well designed space made to integrate as well as you can, uh, consistent with being used by buses with the rest of the precinct, uh, and as people friendly as possible, including uh, a good quality uh, facility building for passengers. Now, it'll be obvious to you reading the report, um, we're in the familiar territory here of concepts and choices that all involve trade-offs. There are pros and there are cons with the concepts, the options, the choices we have to make around how we address the bus problem. I suppose um, really one of the, a couple of key points we're suggesting you think about today is that it doesn't matter whether we're having the discussion today or in six months or in five years' time, there are going to be disadvantages with any option anybody comes up with to help solve the bus problem. And indeed, one of the reasons we've ended up here is that other options have come and gone over time. But a second key point we're making to you is that doing nothing about the buses, letting this opportunity float by and leaving it for another day, also has disadvantages as well. The problem is not going to go away. So there is not going to be a perfect solution. The answer is how do we get to the optimum mix? So that's the second issue. These two concepts are the second issue covered by the report on the bus facilities. The third um, issue we're addressing about the bus facility relates to the recommendation that the best way to go forward on which of these concepts is best, which how we can best validate our current assumptions about the pros and cons, how we can add to our knowledge, uh, should be by us progressing uh, a market engagement process. Now, the advantage of where we've got to in the process, assuming Council has agreed to that today, is that we will be going out to the market, being able to state with certainty that the site will be redeveloped. We'll be able to state with clarity that we do want a range of outcomes that are important to the group that we do want a bus facility as part of the set of outcomes and that we're really seeking proposals and thinking on the optimum way to address the mix of design, strategic, city development, transport and financial outcomes that we are wanting as part of the mix from the site. So to finish up, councillors, if I perhaps go back to where we uh, started this process, this is a significant strategic opportunity that has been presented to progress something that's important, that's tangible and that's meaningful in the city centre master plan and to largely be able to achieve it through private investment. This is the prime remaining central downtown redevelopment site, right on the interface, or if you like, the gateway to the viaduct. It absolutely merits an iconic development so that we can finish off, if you like, that part of downtown with a flourish right up there in quality terms with the rest of what has been done and which the council should be proud of as a result of both public and private sector investment. This team, which has worked on this now for some months, believes that we do need to progress the opportunity, which is really what you decided to do in December. And we consider that the recommended approach with respect to the transport outcomes is the optimum way to get the result that will stand the test of time. 
So, Chair, we're happy to um, answer questions which we will allocate between the team as appropriate. Uh, thank you, David. Good outline, and um, thanks for this report. Um, members, I think we'll, we'll take exclusively questions at this time, uh, and then we'll take comments later. Um, now, first of all, I'd like to explore the questions uh, raised in writing, and thank you to the councillors who who sent through questions in advance to the team. Uh, Councillor Coombe, I, I wouldn't mind going to... I think you did receive replies, but you've got one further question, at least. Um, and would you like to take this time now um, to just outline your satisfaction or otherwise with the initial replies and uh, um, put your next question on the table, please? Thank you, Mr Chair. Tēnā kōroa. Um, good to see where this is landing. We're probably at the place we should have been with development experts and a strategic approach right from the beginning, so really pleased that we're, we're getting there. Um, I do have a few questions, a couple just around the, the development and then a couple that are procedural. Um, first of all, in terms of bus facilities, the report doesn't define what bus facilities are. And a bus facility could be a bus station, it could be a bus de depot, it could be layover. Um, so I just, um, I have proposed to the chair that that be defined, but I think if we could get real clarity around what a bus facility is, because we all probably have different presumptions. So that's my first question, maybe. Uh, we thought you made a good point, Councillor, and we thought it was also fine to incorporate that into the uh, resolution. We thought your definition was was fine. Uh, well, Ross might want to speak to that because it was actually his his definition. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what do we mean by a bus facility? So, we mean some space, you know, for short term layover of buses when they're between their journeys. You know, some, you know, charging as we move the fleet to electric, you know, seating, seating areas for passengers and also where they are able to get um, information around, you know, next journeys and potentially, you know, you know, in a waiting sort of space, waiting room, you know, bathroom facilities. Thank you. Um, I think that really needs, the market really needs to understand what we're expecting. Um, the second question is, it doesn't, it's not clear in the report that if there's two options, the on-site or the on-street, on-street removes the flyover, which is a long-term aspiration of the city centre master plan, but it's not clear that that's also still possible if we go ahead with the on-site option. So it doesn't um, mean we can't remove the flyover. It's a separate project. So I just want to make that absolutely clear because we don't want to lose sight of that aspiration in the city centre master plan. That's right, Councillor, because it's quite possible that if someone was looking to put the bus facility on site, they would use the other space for some, some other part of the development. So we will be going with the two concepts. You're correct, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. So if we do on site, we could still, the flyover isn't, it's not dependent on the flyover being there. It's possible someone would come up with uh, an option purely to put it on site and not do the flyover but it's probable that from the from a development perspective, it would be best to have all the space. So the, um, the expectation we have is that the bus, the sorry, the flyover coming down would be the probable outcome of our discussions. Right, but that's only, only the on-street option that's clear in the report. Uh, what I'm saying is it should be not be precluded that either option we progress with the market, the flyover can still be removed. Yeah, in the back, you that's shouldn't be quite right. Yeah. They're not mutually exclusive and Great. we've we've been careful in the languaging not to present them as a kind of either or. And in fact it's important we can go to the market and talk about both concepts because someone could well come up, probably will come up with hybrids. Um, and I need to ask on behalf of the Waiheke local board, when we had the previous report they raised with me that their views weren't incorporated into that. And we did ask that their views would be in this report, and they're still not there. So I just wondered what discussions have happened with the Waiheke local board, and as part of this process, um, they very much want to have their input as well.
Thank you, Councillor. Um, we offered a workshop and presentation to the Waiheke Local Board. Through their advisers, they asked for uh, an information memo, which we have sent them, and uh, the feedback that we've received to date is that that was enough for them at that, at that point. So you know what their feedback is? Is that kind of in the mix? They, the, um, the information that we received from their advisers is what that was that we didn't need to take their feedback. They didn't want that at the time. They just wanted a memo from us outlining uh, what was in the presentation, what's in the report today. So we've done that. And we haven't received any feedback from them since. Okay, we have thank checked you. for that too. Um, th thanks for that. But uh, this, Mr Chair, I think there might have been some confusion because the expectation of the Waiheke Local Board was that they were going to provide input just as the White Matar Local Board has. Um, so they would still like that opportunity to be able to give their feedback in terms of the community needs. Okay, um, we have got this paper. We, we need to make a decision on this today. Now, we might hear from them after this decision. I'm happy for that. But, um, members, we've considered this now um, th three, four times, and we need to pro progress to making a decision today. Okay. I'll I'm just... not, you're not suggesting we're going to put a decision on hold to, to hear that feedback. I'm not. That's not what you're suggesting. Well, I think that's what the Waiheke Local Board would like to know, that there's a step that they are going to be able to give their input. I guess I can, can, can what I what I have been, has been expressed to me, I mean, obviously a lot of Wai, um, Waiheke locals use the downtown car park. So they, they want to just be able to share their community needs as part of this process. So it might be that they can respond to the memo as a way to address that. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm sure offer. David's team will follow up, yeah. um, Marin and, and yeah. others, with, yeah. with that board and any other board that might uh, express an interest. And, and sorry, I do just need to just raise one last poor issue, Mr Chair, sorry. Just procedurally, um, the, the report refers to resolutions that are still confidential. So I would have thought that they need to be made public so that the public can read this report and understand what those resolutions are and backs them up. Um, but I think that the confidential item says it won't actually be made public until after the market process. So I just wonder, is this something that we need to add to make sure that members of the public can actually read all of the background together because these resolutions don't make sense from a confidential report? Um, I think um, Kalinda can actually speak to that. It's something that we have discussed um, and I'm pretty confident that we can actually release a lot more a lot earlier. Yes, so we do have a process that when um, the information is no longer confidential that we can actually attach that information to a further report on the agenda, so just for information for the public. Um, I've had a look through the resolutions and I think the resolutions were released but not the the report, um, so the decisions were released, but not the report. Once the report is able to be released, we can ret um, attend attach that to an uh, information only item. Thank you, Kalinda. Thank you. Um, uh, now, Councillor Walker, I understand you raised a question with the Auckland Transport um, bus team as well, and you've had some responses on that. And 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 you have a further question. Now, if I may. Yes, please. Um, so the first question I've got is essentially a question to um, Auckland Transport, and it goes to um, whatever the words are around the uh, bus facility that Councillor Koo mentioned. So it was mentioned that this includes a layover, charging, and, um, and I think uh, some seating or the like. Um, my, my question is that I thought from Auckland Transport, the fundamental thing around this bus facility was around taking the buses off the, off the street or at the very least generating significant efficiency so we didn't have kilometres of, um, of um, bus uh, travel and clogging the streets. And if that is not in the specification, I've got a concern and I'd certainly invite Auckland Transport to um, respond to that. Welcome, Pete. Pete Moss from Auckland Transport. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, so to be clear, bus facilities, as, as Ross has outlined, would incorporate operational as well as passenger facilities. So there would be the ability to lay over buses on a short-term basis, so up to 10 minutes, and okay. that will take them off the streets. So I understand that. So my concern, because I haven't seen these words, but uh, quite obviously what we're specifying needs to be complete. Otherwise, the engagement of whoever the private parties are is going to be um, problematic. So I would invite your um, comment, um, not necessarily right now, but to feed into whatever that specification is. The other um, question I've got, which is also a question to Auckland Transport, deals with um, D3, which is one of the recommendations. And the recommendation uh, at this point specifies provision for a flexible multimodal transport hub that supports public access to micro-ability. Um, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. It's D1 I'm referring to, provision of a bus facility either as part of the site redevelopment or by removing the Lower Hobson Street flyover and replacing the space underneath it with an on-street bus facility. Now, my question around this is that I have not seen any plans, for example, for what um, the um, facility might be if we remove the flyover. Obviously, there have, has been some preliminary planning for the um, facility that's in the building, I would have thought it would have been better for us not to be so prescriptive because there could be a hybrid model, for example. I can't second guess that. Um, so I would have thought that we might be saying provision of a bus facility either as part of the site development and or by removing the lower Hobson Street flyover and replacing the space underneath with rather than an, remove the an, um, on-street bus facility. And as Mr Rankin pointed out, or uh, Ross Jernside, I'm not sure, um, part of the facility could involve, either way, indoor space in the building. Let's go to, a, let's go to an answer on that question. So the way it's written at the moment, David, uh, Ross, it's, it, you could say it's, it's one or the other, but my interpretation of that is we're going to leave it up to the, the creative response of, of parties and their... Is there potential for a, a blend with, within the way the resolutions are currently structured? Yeah, through, through the chair, yeah, your, yeah, your articulation is correct. And the changes suggested by Councillor Walker would make that resolution, you know, more appropriate. You know, so that actually we can test the full range of options with the market. I'm happy to entertain that, Councillor. I, I look, we could just have an and or there. Um, well, I think we can just work that out because I think it's important to accommodate the, the feedback here. Um, um, so thank you, Councillor Walker. Any any further questions, yes. please? Yes. So the other issue also goes to the uh, question that Councillor Coombe made, uh, which is recommendation B, where we are referring to strategic outcomes, but we're not listing those outcomes. Are you referring to the strategic outcomes that we confirmed at this committee in December? Yes, so can we, can we itemise uh, those for completeness? They have been itemised, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, they've been confirmed by resolution and you've got those um, in hand. Uh, we've gone through those, so we're only dealing with a transport strategic um, outcome at this meeting. Through you, Mr Chair, we're moving item B which specifically mentions strategic outcomes. Those strategic outcomes are highly strategic. They're very important. It's what this is about. We should be itemising what they are, both for ourselves and also for the public. And, I mean, I can't second guess what they are because they're not in the agenda item. One of the concerns I've got, for example, is around um, electric vehicle charging. Um, I think let's, that's a high order let's have, outcome. Let's pose that back to... David and Ross. Uh, Ross, from reading your agenda, you do refer to those strategic outcomes, Māori, urban form, environment, etc. Et um, I, I look, from my reading, you do have that in hand. Um, David, are you best to... Yeah, that's correct, Chair. I mean, look, when, when we've communicated this to the public, we've talked about all the outcomes. We did a major release 
of this a while ago now with all the outcomes there. When it's um, when we engage with the market, it'll be all the outcomes. It's just slightly distorted, if you like, today because we just focus on the sole remaining bit, as you pointed out. So there didn't seem to us to be a lot of point in repeating it all ad nauseum, but they are essential. They are essential. Um, the earlier resolutions are an essential component of the package. I understand that. My concern is that we're voting on something and it ain't here in black and white. Um, no, look, I'm sorry, it is there. It's in the report. Um, yeah. and we it have says dealt... groupings in the report. And I hear what you're saying. Members, I just need to... Um, I know it's a little while since we dealt with this in December, but we actually did formally consider the uh, other strategic outcomes and we confirmed those outcomes. And they are on our record and they are, uh, they are actually now on the open record, those resolutions, um, I believe. Not the report, but the... The, the um, resolutions are on the open record and they are quite prescriptive from, from memory. So members, I'm, I'm going to have to say we're going to have to leave that as it is. Uh, I'm absolutely confident and it's fundamental to us considering any uh, proposal uh, from any party that might be coming forward that they reflect and deliver on those strategic outcomes and we have well articulated those and they're in place. Okay, further question? So the other question I've got, and this is a question for you, um, David. Um, we're going out to bidders. The bidders that are coming up with uh, proposals obviously have to be reliant on the information that we're um, providing. They're going to be coming back with um, um, options. You mentioned there's going to be an expression of interest uh, process first. Um, conceivably, we could have a situation where you've got a, um, a proposal from one bidder that has got merit, a proposal from another bidder that have, may have merit, there may be variations. We may want to um, pick up on some of the things that a particular bidder has um, put up. How are we going to um, resolve that process so that we actually have um, access to the intellectual property, if you, if you call it that, that is arriving from these bids so that we can arrive at what the best design is. David, are you answer, able to answer, please? Uh, yeah, and I might get Alan Young to help with that. But, I mean, look, the way these processes run is there's, there's a huge expenditure for some party to get to the level of detailed design. And we will have arrived at a preferred party well before we get to that point. So it's unlikely, um, well, do you want to? Uh, so I can't really add much more than what David has uh, articulated in regard to our uh, three-stage process in regard to pre-market engagement where we'll be seeking what is that term uh, articulates is what is the response to these options that we are taking up to the market that will help inform our expressions of interest uh, process. So we will be responding uh, particularly to how the market is viewing these options and then we'll be moving forward. Uh, to come back to various options that we will receive, um, we deal with this on a constant basis with the bids that we're receiving on other properties. There is an appropriate process where we are reflecting as a group on this particular case in regard to the design outcomes. Uh, to come back to the point, we are very clear as to what we're hoping to achieve and weigh up against the City Centre Master Plan with regard to those high-level strategic outcomes. And of course, as uh, David's articulated with regard to the bus facility, we may well end up with a hybrid basis to which we'll work through. So our processes uh, are built in um, to take into account that we will have various um, bids as we come through. So, Thank so you, how do we how do we pick up on the? We can't just pinch people's intellectual property, councillor. So I mean, oh. um, and bluntly, um, so we have to make judgments against the outcomes you've set of what's the best overall mix. But I do note that. In general, you get more into the intellectual property stage when you start moving further down the path of, of design, and um, that's not a stage we're going to get to with um, many parties and probably possibly, quite probably only with one. Because it, there's an immense cost on a, a project this size getting down to 
the you know paying armies of, uh, uh, of architects to uh, design a, a, yep. a big thing like okay, this. Okay, I think we're going to have to leave that there, gentlemen. Um, Councillor, we have to rely on Akepanuku. They are skilled at this work. They've been doing it <laughs> yeah, for a I've long time now. Uh, and there are strict criteria, including our strategic outcomes, to score any proposals by. Um, now, I need to go to others, Councillor. one other question. No, I'm sorry. Okay, well, um, I'll, yeah, I'll ask the question that's later. That's why... I've got eight councillors wanting to ask questions and everybody has to have a fair opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sayers, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, when you weren't here, I made an apology that I need to leave around about three or so, so thank you for taking my question, or 3.30. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a broad question, really. It's uh, to do with a concern that I probably have around the short-term parking and what's been reported in the report um, and, you know, we seem to be halving, halving, halving. So I, I think it's probably more asking for some sort of professional advice or professional opinion um, about around the numbers that, that uh, are required. And I guess part of my concern is the investment that we've put into the Viaduct Basin, the number of visitors that we're trying to get down there, as well as in, uh, you know um, the city centre in general, and people not being able to get there by car and have short-term parking to um, for us to capitalise on that investment. So, is there any general comment you could make uh, just to alleviate my concern there? Well, I guess a couple of things, um, Councillor. The we we obviously tossed around numbers extensively in previous sessions. And um, I suppose the consensus we picked, which is really where we got to as a group, uh, thinking about the issues more carefully, is that there is a lot of parking available in the city centre. The main uh, strategic purpose of the council is to have increasing percentage of people coming into the centre on, you know, other than individual cars. But in any case, we are confident that any of the developer parties will be proposing to put in short-stay public parking, and we're going to be making that one of the specific parts of the proposal process. So the worst that's going to happen, or <laughs> the worst or the best, depending on your philosophical point of view, is that there will probably end up being a reduction in the quantum of short-stay public parking. Um, but there will be a credible amount of short-stay public parking, and there are plenty of other options. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sayers? Yeah, thank, thank you. I guess, uh, um, probably to I mind this, because I have to leave, uh, Chair, I'll just, um, just, but you could nod or not. My understanding, we're going from 13, then we looked at 700, and maybe we even look at half of that. I get that. My concern is, where do we land between the, say, 450 and 700 mark, is my, um, is, is my major concern. David, there was a there there was a debate that um, generally generally the consensus we got from councillors was to question the need for the same level of short stay parking that's really a, a legacy feature of how the city centre used to work with most people coming in in private vehicles, and so when we reflected on that and. Did, you know, discuss the issues more carefully ourselves. We were comfortable that we don't need to have anything like the current number there, but we do need a credible um, number, whatever it turns out to be, uh, and, and that's just something we're going to have to work out as we go through the process with the developer. I mean, it will obviously be in the developer's interest to provide short-stay public parking, and it is going to be one of the criteria that we will have in assessing the proposals. Uh, th thank you for the answer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sayers. Councillor Sayers, if you do need to leave and if you need to go back to the office, we can give you a Skype facility to stay participating if you need, OK? Thank you. Um, Councillor Casey, you have a question, please. It's just a simple one, David. Um, access for everyone is, is looking to make it easier for people who have disabilities to get around the city. And that would include being this being... Um, you just pull the microphone oh, over in front, please. Thank you. 
I'm looking for the word accessibility somewhere in this brief, and I'm not finding it. All I'm finding is um, parking for um, people with disabilities. Where, where, where in the brief are we? I'll tell you what's bothering me, David, and you can answer this. The buses in, in most of these um, premier transport hubs go downstairs and the people go upstairs. So that makes a difficulty for people who are, already have a, a disability. Is that, are we limiting at all, at the moment, are we limiting where the buses go and where the people go in, in, in this initial brief? Or is that still to come out in the designs? Where do we say we want it to be fully accessible? If it's an add-on, sometimes it becomes too Andrew, expensive. Andrew Allen from like, you know, further down the track. If it's in at the beginning, I'd be a lot happier to, to see it somewhere. Uh, Councillor, just, just responding to your question about accessibility and mobility. Uh, part D2 of our resolution, which includes for the multimodal transport hub, the space for the multimodal transport hub, specifically calls out mobility uh, parking. Well, I've seen that. It's not just about mobility parking, it's about accessibility, being able to enter, get around, find your way. And what I'm worried about is if we don't have the word accessible in there... Um, yeah, I think that's uh, a good point, uh, Councillor. Yeah. Let's, let's um, perhaps, if, if Andrew and Ross get something appropriate in there. Yeah. Sometimes when you add it in later, you say it's too expensive to do that. And I'm saying, why don't we say that at the beginning? No, no, that'd be, that, that yeah. would be our full expectation in this day and age that the accessibility is in a, in a public you know, in a bus facility. So we... Can we add in the words? We, yeah, we can cover that off. Um, it's also fundamental. It's it's um, it's part of the access for everyone in the city centre master plan, and it's that's where the detail of accessibility sits. But we'll cover it off here for you, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hills, please, question. Thank you very much. Um, the This is... Yeah, a, a lot better, and I feel a lot more comfortable reading this. On the um, bus parking, uh, like, are we being ambitious enough with this this site and the surrounding site and what can happen here? Because it's clear at some point in our history, half of the city block was taken up for that. There's, there's eight lanes of road there at some point in between the buildings and uh, on the other side of... Customs and Fanshawe and Sturdy, and then there's this big uh, hole as well, which kind of doesn't have anything in it. If we are, are we thinking the whole little precinct there, which we could take away the flyovers, take away some of that land, and actually maybe on the other side of the downtown car park, which you'd have a bus station, but also you could probably put another apartment building in there. There's that much space. If you look above, you, with some point in our history, we sliced off half that that block. So are we actually thinking about the full potential of what we could A, earn as a council, but also enable if we are taking away that flyover? David. Well, I'd make two comments, Council. The first is that sort of idea, if it's feasible, is, is the kind of thing we're talking about coming out of a process of quality engagement. Um, yeah. That's exactly the kind of thing which we might not be actively thinking about now, but someone else might. But going to the core of your question, I mean, look, I think we're being well and truly ambitious. When you look at the range of outcomes, you add up what we've got here with what we've had before. We're asking, I think I made this point, we're asking for an awful lot from one site. And here we are now, it's evolved since we started to also throw in the Hobson, the, uh, you know, the flyover that's been sitting there for like this for 20 years, people have been talking about pulling that down. So I think there's plenty of ambition in what we're doing when we just got to be careful we don't make it so ambitious that, um, you know, we don't get anywhere. So, um, so yes, I think we're being, uh, I think we're certainly pushing the ambition in the range of outcomes we're seeking, but the type of thing you're raising is certainly open to come out of a process of discussion with a developer. Okay. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a criticism about ambition. I, I, I just hope that we are not um, precluding, you know, that the, the whole half of the site, which is almost as big a, 
is half of the downtown car park site, that Wolf Street, Federal Street, Fanshawe corner could be, if a developer or someone said, hey, could we look at that as well, then you probably have all the outcomes addressed and we would potentially get a whole lot more income as well. I just worry that we could set up uh, or, or not enable uh, development on the other side of those flyovers and because it really is in some parts if you look above eight lanes wide with this big the steps and the, all that you know connection because presumably if we take up the flyover we have to take out that big concrete wall and kind of smooth out the gradients I which, think we're getting into some detail to be honest I, don't know, I know that the but, potential is going to be looked at here yeah I just don't want us to someone come back 10 years later and go man that would have been awesome um, yeah the other question is, how long do we... We want to be able to come back in 10 years and go, man, at least it happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. But the, I'm just saying that we don't... We're, this, as you say, is the last piece of significant waterfront site. And if we could double the amount of available site for someone, then to me that seems kind of smart. Yeah, and look, that's why we've had the, the discussion lead to the point of let's go for it and put the flyover on the table. Yeah. Um, how long do we think... and this is a question uh, based on, because of people's concerns of the car parking, this whole site, once under development, is it between four to five years we will not have access to it in a car or a bus or a anything, presumably? Um, it's, a, it's, it's a fair way down the track before we know the answers to those questions, councillors. I mean, everyone knows that a construction project of this magnitude will unfortunately involve disruption to parking and road patterns again. There's no way around that, but just how we best manage that is, you know, in that sequencing I talked about, that's some way off and would definitely need to be with the developer. Yep. Thank you. And uh, kia ora, Member Leanne Namani, please. Kia ora. I'm just going to try and keep it brief. Um, similar um, to Councillor Casey's question, um, yes, it's about the transport network and, of course, with some of the flow on land use changes, historically that's tended to push Māori out into the periphery, um, resulting in access and affordability issues in terms of getting, getting places. So I'm just, the memo, so I'm just signalling and, and going through it, the need to kind of investigate at a high level land use impact on communities, like particularly Māori and Pacifica, the memo doesn't preclude that from happening, does it? No, but at the end of the day, if we think about what's happening here, we're taking a chunk of the city centre that's um, an ageing car park structure and another piece of the city contiguous to it that's got um, you know, the overbridge on it and we're, ch we're changing it to be a space that will be in keeping with, you know, the next 80 or 100 years of the city. So this is a different set of issues from, if you like, some of the more complicated gentrification questions that I think you're alluding to that are often part of, you know, moving into an existing residential and potentially displacing people who have been there. That's not really arising because, as I say, this is, this is a pretty... This is a piece of city that really reflects our past, not the future. And there will be a new residential community here, but we're not displacing someone that's here at the moment. No, no, but yeah, I was referring to the ongoing consequences of it, but yeah. Um, and I just note that there was a comment around a plan to work with mana whenua to identify partnership opportunities. Again, the memo doesn't preclude that from occurring and enables that from occurring and would just be keen to understand, if at all possible, like what you have in mind around that space. Sure. So fundamentally, which is a normal part of our work, we look at that in two ways. I mean, one is there's the commercial opportunity, although this is a huge scale, but uh, Manafina were advised by us in February um, that the council had uh, 
decided that this site will go to the market and we um, indicated we would keep in touch with them, particularly once today's over, you know, once the outcomes are set. So uh, EWI will be free as uh, either in their own capacities or by teaming up if they want to be involved somehow in the development proposals process. Um, yeah, and, we, and then the second thing is the uh, fantastic opportunity there will be in this development, as has been the case in the waterfront or commercial bay, to articulate um, uh, the Māori narrative of the, of the place. And, I mean, I suppose the best way I'd describe what we'll be doing is a version closely modelled on what happened with the Aotea Station uh, overdevelopment, where Māori design narrative uh, outcomes were brought in right at the start. There are a requirement that will be built into the development agreement. Um, so we will be using an appropriately amended version of that for this, and it, it will be a fantastic opportunity to do it. It will be one of the great outcomes of repurposing this part of the waterfront. Top point. And just, I guess, probably just a comment just with the um, Māori Impact Statement. The IMSB Chair is still on the ATAP Governance Group. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that reminder. If there's any omission there, we'll uh, cover that off. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Simpson. Thanks, Mr Chair. I'm just, um, I just want to note that I did send my questions through and they haven't been answered, so anyway. Um, look, I just want to ask some real quick questions, David, um, because this can be very hard and take a long time or it can be quite simple, right? So, question one, this is not the final decision, right? Is this it? is where you're finally deciding the transport outcomes and you have decided all the other outcomes. So, for example, if we don't know how what the parking is and we don't like it or whatever, that's the, this is this is this is the time to say I want a specific number or I don't. I mean, I, we haven't got the evidence. So, with regard to the specific, this is the general transport outcomes, but it's not the specific around it, or is it? Well, when we it's say the evidence, the I mean we 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 sort of. We've been through that process of wanting more and more detailed information about parking, but at the end of the day, where does it sort of take you? So what what we're saying is we're going to the market on parking and a specific part of what will be requested was is what, what the developer is going to do with short-stay parking. Okay. So if we didn't like that, is it too 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 bad? If you, if you want a minimum number, today is the time you have to set it. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, so, and, and perhaps just in the spirit of your question, we will obviously, at appropriate times through the process and consultation of the Chair, be coming back workshopping with you where this is all heading. But if you want a minimum number of car parks, that's a, a material thing that we should know before we get out into the market. Okay, I'll receive my right to speak. Okay, so really we're just being asked, from what I see, four things. One, that... We need to have a bus facility. We've all agreed that we need to have a bus facility. It was going to be in Custom Street, and it was going to be in Key Street, and now Britomart, and now it's potentially going to be here. So um, we kind of got to agree to that one, because we know there needs to be one, but we're just trying to define whether it should be in this this place or not, correct? The second thing is, is the removal of the um, potential and or, and I support Councillor Walker and his slight um, amendment to, the, to DI, um, if the Hobson Street flyover was removed, is there still a, will that still give a vehicle option from Key Street up Hobson Street? Or will Key Street end at the set of lights at the bottom of the flyover? Back to Andrew Allen from Auckland Transport. Um, Key Street effectively, well, uh, to answer the question, if you're travelling in a vehicle and you want to get up onto Hobson Street, you're going to have to use the network that's currently in place, i.e. probably Custom Street West, Market and the like. You're, you're not going to be able to obviously use the flyover, it will be gone. So you're not going to be able to go east-west along C Key Street, you'll have to use Custom Street. Is that correct? Pr pretty much. Okay, I just wanted to know that. Um, the... I asked the car parking question. 
Is there a process now, because I agree with Councillor Coombe, um, the Orake people visit the central city and spend in the central city significantly. Is it an opportunity, what opportunity do they have going forward to be involved or to hear or to have updates or whatever about this project? If there is a local board that wants to be um, communicated with us on this issue particularly, then we will do our best to um, address that. But look, at the end of the day, this is a big city shaping decision and it's really with the governing body and there will be impacts as there are with all the other decisions of magnitude that you've made about the city centre. Um, the, the amount of parking that's potentially not going to be available as a result of this redevelopment is pretty small in relation to the total quantum of parking in the city centre. Um, it's not like this is the only place that people can go. But if, if the Orake board has a particular interest, I'm happy to give an undertaking that we'll communicate with them at appropriate points through the process. Thank you. And my final question is around um, the timing of this works vis-a-vis -vis all the other disruption that's happening in the city and people trying to get in around through, whether it be by bus or anything else. So, I mean, we're just coming up for air on Key Street. What do you think if the button was pushed today, what's the beginning of the digging in the ground? Well, as we sit here today, um, Councillor, the, the, just the process of getting a development agreement, go, going through a market process and getting a development agreement in place of something of this size and complexity takes you out to probably the latter parts of next year then there's a whole lot of work ahead of the developers, so you're, pro you're doing a good six years, probably a little bit more from today. Hopefully even light rail will be done by then in this early stage. The CRL will be operational. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and just this, the last, sorry, one more. Uh, around the um, buses, so you're, where will we be with our electric buses? Um, I'm just worried about we've got all this nice green, you know, nice open space and we're worrying about the black carbon and Queen Street. Are we going to have a whole lot of diesel buses idling outside the tepid baths, potentially, when we've just gone to all the trouble of trying to fix the um, yeah. Queen Street? So I can have a go at answering that. Uh, so the current plan is that we will have the entire fleet in the city centre electric by 2030 and half the fleet by 2025. So somewhere between 15 and 100% of the fleet would be, would be electric by the time this is, this is um, construction. Okay. And Pete, um, just before you go, you, you have um, Auckland Transports, uh, they now instruct operators to its motors off after a couple of minutes or something. You know, they don't sit there for five, 10 minutes idling if it is a diesel bus. Is that That's correct? correct, yeah, there's no idling signs up at, at, at stops to, to prevent that happening. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Watson, please. Thanks, uh, this question for Auckland Transport personnel here going to the, the issue of uh, the provision of um, short-term parking. Um, dur during the any number of the workshops we got, we received a, a very consistent uh, commentary from Auckland Transport going to the importance of short-term parking uh, as it goes to supporting the, the, the city centre's vibrancy and economy, but, but also to e equity across the region, so basically making the, the city centre accessible to, to everyone, and that, that was repeated on a number of occasions. And, and really that was a consequence of, um, as we were told on one workshop there, basically market failure. Um, you know, that's Auckland Transport um, has, has taken up that role and, and thankfully they have to, to provide that sort of accessibility to, to, for everyone across Auckland. So I guess I just would seek from Auckland Transport um, official uh, how that reconciles then with point 72 in the, in the report which talks about um, basically no specific requirement for short-term parking will be required 
and instead we'll we'll give that over to the competitive market process. Um, so th there seems to be a, a fundamental conflict there between what we were told in all the workshops as to this very important role short-term parking plays and Auckland Transport's part in that, whether as operator or, or, or setting the, the conditions, and this approach here where it's just getting left to the market. So, Chair, perhaps I can answer that. I mean, it is correct that there was previously numbers argued for. The whole process I referred to of discussion and workshopping with councillors is for the purpose of listening to arguments and taking on board points. And the clear consensus that we as a group got was that in the hierarchy of different things, outcomes you want from the site, short prescribed numbers of short stay public parking wasn't so important. You do want some, and which is why we're proposing to ask the developer to outline as part of the proposal what will be provided. But the judgment the group has made is that um, we shouldn't go out with a prescribed number, and that takes into account what we believe is the feedback from earlier workshops. If we're wrong, I guess someone <laughs> moving something today will establish it, but we do need to sort it out today. Okay, so, so a follow-up question, and, and, it, and it, I would appreciate if it was an Auckland Transport person answered this one in particular, because um, Mr Rankin's now repeated on a couple of occasions, very, very helpfully I might add, that the short-term short-stay parking will be our credible amount. That's been um, reported twice there. Um, throughout all our workshops, and in very recent workshops, um, Auckland Transport personnel, uh, given their expertise in administrating this facility, came up with fairly specific numbers as to what that credible amount would mean. So I would thought, if unless it's just going to be left entirely open to the market to come up with some number, I'm assuming that Auckland Transport will inform that credible amount that Mr Rankin referred to, which we have been given pretty precise indication as to what it is, 400 to 700 spaces, which is about half of what is currently available. So the simple assumption I've got, I assume other councillors have, if we're going to a credible number, It'll be our exports, expert, or, or exports, our experts, and Auckland Transport that will be providing that information. That's that's what we've had in every single workshop that we've received on this matter. Okay, question, and I'll ask Andrew Allen to respond, please. I just want to make sure I actually understand the question, Councillor. Sorry, uh, I think the question was: Will Auckland Transport be? involved in advising around the credibility of the number? Absolutely. The answer to that is yes. Okay. And the, the follow-up, uh, Andrew, if you don't mind, is, f you know, in the, in the interests of good faith here in terms of, you know, our participation in all the workshops, um, I'm assuming that that number, therefore, will be based on the, you know, the pages of information we've had from the PWC report to the various workshops, which is again is very consistent in both the need for a credible number and what that credible number should be. So that's a reasonable assumption to make, isn't it, given this backdrop to where we've got to today. Andrew, can you address that question? But you, I think you need to preface that there's, we've travelled a long way on this. We've had workshops, we've had discussion, and we've been trying to arrive at a point of consensus. So there's been some political inputs into where we are sitting today in this report. Um, can you... Point of order, please. The question was directed from a councillor to an officer, not by yourself. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm guiding the officer... No, I, I have this right as your chair, and this, the question will be responded to, and I'm asking the responder, uh, Mr Allen, to also reflect on what's happened since those early workshops. I'm not sure whether that, that might sit with um, Andrew or, or David. Well, Chair, um, I, Mr Allen, I have the same point, when, with the same perspective, which I articulated before, and you're quite right. The, there's no, there's never been a magic number. I mean, when no one's ever tried to say to you there is a magic number. There is a judgment to be made here about how much short stay parking is in this site versus all the other options there are in the city centre. And there are all sorts of numbers quoted th 
through the workshops, we've taken on board what we think the majority of you told us. So there's credible doesn't translate to four to 700, otherwise we would have put four to 700 in here. It means more than 50 or more than some derisory number. It needs to be, you know, we'll, we'll know it when we see it in the context of the development, when we see the full proposal. Thank you. Could, could I have another shot at asking Mr. Allen a follow up? Maybe he could answer the question. This Supplementary time. from you, Councillor. Yeah, so um, that um, explanation just um, heard then um, isn't, with all due respect, isn't quite in keeping with um, workshop after workshop, which we've had in terms of what a credible number would be. Um, and herein lies the problem, as and Councillor. Um, Simpson has alluded to that today, this where we're going to give our, our, our approval or otherwise to this today. There has been a very clear and consistent indication as to what a credible number would be for this very important equity issue to do with the provision of short stay parking that goes to all our communities across Auckland at this very, couldn't be more important location. So. For me to have confidence in this, Andrew, and I wonder if you can reassure me, um, I need to know that you know <laughs> the months of work and not an, an expensive consultants that were employed in this that came up with a range of numbers, so it wasn't a specific number, but it was a range that gave a very good indication of what we would be providing here. Now, this is absolutely fund fundamental to any number of the strategies that are referred to uh, from the Auckland plan to, to any other one parking strategies in the documentation here. So I could just ask you, uh, Andrew, if indeed in, in terms of the expertise that exists within Auckland Transport, that that range of numbers, if not a precise one, is the one that has informed us throughout this process. 400 to 700. Andrew. That's the information that's been provided to date, Councillor. You're correct. And as David has alluded to, that that is a range. It's not an exact science. It's based on a number of assumptions. And so credible is probably something that alludes to that order of magnitude there or thereabouts. Okay. And my final question, Mr Chair, is that that specific number is considerably down on the current number of sitting around about 1290. So the number that we have uh, discussed in the workshop is in itself almost half what the current figure is, which I think is a, a significant point to note here. I'm correct in saying that, aren't I? Well, just you can. How about you convey that as a comment? We're not. We're just in questions at the moment. But that was a question. It was a pretty precise question, actually. Even I don't mind patting myself on the back, but it was 1290 down to conceivably as low as 400. That's a big drop on our current. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher, you're with thank, us. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman, and my apologies for not being there in person because this is such an important issue for me. Um, but I had a second shot of COVID and it's left me with quite a high fever today, so I, I'm trying to be as coherent as I can. And you will forgive me if I give a little... Um, context to the questions that I want to ask because I've had some experience of exiting contractual situations when new information um, came to light. So it's it, it's sitting very heavily on my shoulders that the matter of good stewardship by us, um, and we've heard extensively today of the importance of this particular site. It's, it's, I'm, I'm trying to remember David's exact words, but he highlighted that it's the last remaining undeveloped site in the waterfront area. So while I tried to ask questions during the LTP and it was, you know, the answers were, well, this isn't a strategic asset, um, it, it actually holds a strategic position in, in what comes next. And I acknowledge that the council's in a challenging position. However, um, we've also got to look to the future as David is encouraging us. So I'm, I'm really trying to grapple with what 
is actually in, in the strategic interests of Aucklanders moving forward. And this is a very much better report than the one that came um, where the meeting was adjourned. I think it was early April, I can't remember now, but it was before Easter, I think. Um, but, but David, do, do you see this as a strategic site? It's a site of strategic importance. It's it's uh, um, absolutely. It's it's something that will, um, as I said in my opening comments, it's really a key missing bit that will finish off the enormous package of public and private investment that, that that's gone into that critical part of our city centre, and it will come at a great time. I, I really struggle with supporting this today because I would like the answers to those questions. We're making a number of assumptions around mode shift and so forth, but I, I want to know that I have all of the answers when it comes to short-term parking, when it comes to these others. Now, I know that the answers that you've given us um, about why, you know, why delay, and, and philosophically, I'm not a, opposed to actually having the private sector, I'm, I'm agnostic about who makes the provision of a service, as long as it's accessible. Um, but the difficulty is in the brief we're giving you today, it's incomplete. And it doesn't come back to us, as, as I understood in your answer to Councillor Simpson. We will not have the opportunity again. Um, this is your mandate to go into a market process today, is it? David. The, um, the mandate was actually um, the result of a resolution in December. What we're finalising today is the big outcomes that you as councillors want from this um, redevelopment, which is your governance role. So in terms of, you know, and the answer I gave to one of the councillors earlier, if you if you want a minimum number of car parks, this is the time to make that request. There's really no other useful information we've got um, beyond what you've seen in the workshops. Um, so it's really a question now of judgment, and in particular, it's a, it's a question of, of all the competing things here, the city centre master plan, people wanting lots of short stay, convenient parking, the desire for laneways, all the other things we want from the site. What's your hierarchy of priorities? That's really what your outcomes decision are defining for us. So on, on parking, there's really no more, we're really saying there's no more useful stuff to come from us. It's really a judgment now from you as the governing body. If you want to set a minimum number, today's the time to do it. Otherwise, we leave it to um, developers to present proposals which will give us a credible number, but we don't give them a prescribed number to work to. Thank you, David. Thank well, you, I, I, I see that. I have to interpret that as it is the sign-off today, and I think that the brief is insufficient. And if we're, if we are delaying for a short time because, you know, we, we, we are expecting these developers to come up with a lot of information that we ourselves don't want to fund. I think that's very short-term thinking, and I'd rather spend it on that and getting that right uh, than the America's Cup, to be frank. It's, this, is a, this is going to be a piece of land that's critical looking out the next 50 to 100 years, and it does need upgrading. But we have to be clear about the brief, and I don't feel comfortable with the lack of, of specific detail on the short-term parking. Okay, thank you. Councillor Coombe, please. Oh, thank you for the opportunity just to ask a few more questions because I think a lot of what we're discussing is in the report and what we've previously received as information. We, uh, um, I'm, I'm just, this might be a little bit um, oh, but I've got cutting questions. you, but I need to really narrow it down to I, questions. Okay, so I have got questions and I just need to think we should just confirm that um, Precinct currently already have about 200 short-term these car parks in the downtown car park, so any negotiation will take into account of that. And that was part of the tunnel negotiation that's on a public agenda from 2015. Precinct have had a contractual commitment to parking which was revised at that time but actually pre-existed that. 
uh, and there's another party as well, so that will all be part of the due diligence information provided to right. developers. So um, anything that we're deciding today is the strategic direction around what is required for the city in 2028? Is that how long this project is likely to take? So there's likely to be it's a fair five to six years. So we, we've all got to be thinking about 20, the city in 2028, not the, not the needs of today. And just in terms of thinking ahead, is it right that we had previously, when it was presented about parking in the city, that 80% of the Fanshawe Street car parks are currently in long-term leases? So that's an opportunity there for Auckland Transport to release a lot of short-term parking. If there's a need for short-term parking now for the next five years, that's where we can provide it, and that's what we control currently. I think I've, I think Andrew Anlin's put that in a memo to me that's going to go on the agenda for the planning committee at some point. but. Uh, the answer to that statement is correct. The 80% in yeah. this. Yes, I'm just very keen for us to, to make evidence-based decision based evidence-based decision that reinforces our strategic direction that we've already given, rather than us trying to be transport planners. And the third um, one, just about some of the stats, when we previously got the data around who is using the downtown car park currently, that did not show. It showed is it not correct that most of the users were coming from parts of the city that are very well provisioned by car parking. Huge numbers were actually from the Mount Eden area, from people who live right on the Northern Express busway. We had that map that showed where the majority of people who are accessing downtown car park currently, are, they're, they're using it because it's convenient and cheap, but it's not because they they don't have access to other transport options. Is that correct? Can you confirm? Uh, I can't was. remember the details of that, to be honest. It's, it's, it's going to be consistent with what's been provided to date. Off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly where they were coming from, or the numbers. It was a very good map. It, it was. It enforced for us that this, how this is being used currently, but again, I guess it's how it's going to be used by 2028. So I think those are all material. Thank you. Facts. Thank you. Councillor Walker, please. So uh, I've got a question as to why we wouldn't specify a number at this point. And part of my reasoning for that, again, goes back to the extensive workshops where we were told that we were going to have flexible design so that we could have an area that was parking at this point in time, maybe more short stay parking. That was acknowledged and Auckland Transport gave us detailed information around that. And that amount of short-stay parking or other use might reduce over time once, and again, these are based on assumptions, various things kick in. So, OK, we'll, uh, we'll put that question again. It has been put to you before. I was going to say, Mr Chairman, at the risk of sounding repetitive, um, we did have all sorts of information come in the previous workshops and reports. The purpose of that frankly, is for us all to be listening to each other and to take on board points that are made. We've done that. So today we're saying what we're saying. Let's uh, get a credible number from the market rather than prescribing one. If councillors wish to prescribe a minimum, then today is the time to basically vote for that way. Thank you. Oh, I have a question, Mr Chair, and perhaps it's most appropriately directed to Auckland Transport, and that is... Is it possible to have a building design that allows for flexibility so it could be used for a quantum of short-stay parking at an initial point in time and then be changed? Yes, that would be possible if that's what would be important to you as an outcome. And Thank then my, my further question to that is, if that is the case then, why not specify an that, interim think, amount for short-stay parking. I think Mr Rankin has made it really clear. That's a political decision. They've given all the advice at meetings prior, workshops prior, today's meeting, and it's, it's our call. At the moment, we've got the recommendations before us. So I'm going to leave that there. Council Hills, please. Just a few quick questions, Chair. Um, the current numbers, the percent, it's about 6% of all public car parks are in the city centre is the downtown car park, right? It's only 6% of the total quantum of public of, or available. Sorry, all car parks. Andrew, do you have the percentage? Yep. I think it's, it was related to at an earlier workshop. We own 13% of the car parks, but I think the downtown itself is only 
I, I can't tell you the percentage. We're talking 1,900 odd spaces. Uh, when when you ask of public, isn't it? all yes. Okay, so it's about six percent of the total quantum of car parks. What does the unitary plan requirement for car parking in a development in this area of zero? So I know there's um, Councillor Walker. We all have to listen. To you. Please don't refer to Councillor Walker. We're just asking well, questions. Everyone at this was time. talking around the place. So, so the unitary plan requirement for a development in this area. There's no car parks. Zero car parks. Okay, and the the other thing around. Um, so the six percent. The question, but now I forgot. <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, I'll come back to you if I... Oh, no. So we were told publicly that approximately market value for 100 car parks is about $10 million. If we required... If we're requiring certain quantums of car parks, 400, 700, et cetera, surely that would be... mean that would come off the sale price or we would have to provide that, you know... I know it's negotiated, but <coughs> high level, we would have to require, pay for it, the requirement of parking. Any requirement we make that's different from materially or over and above materially what a developer will do will have a trade-off. That's correct. And I've asked this question before too, but no matter what happens in this development, Auckland Transport or Auckland Council are not going to be managing any car parks in this vicinity. It's never going to be an Auckland Transport, Auckland Council car park as part of this development. That's the point where we reached, yes, that the car parking will not be managed by Auckland Transport. So whatever decision we make today, if it's 10, 400, 700, we do not own and run those car parks? Not the car parks, no. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Megoff, did you have a further? Yeah, sorry, I don't want to prolong this. We'll be here at 8 o'clock tonight already. Um, but I, I, my first question was really a follow-up to Councillor Hills. Um, obviously, we are discounting the return that we get on the building if we specify the number of car parks. My question is, firstly, can we quantify that? And secondly, um, could we end up actually paying the developer for what he was going to provide anyway? Well, that would be a risk. Um, but, but what I meant by my comment with trade-offs is it goes more broadly than financial impacts because... If we tried to load in, say, the 1,000-odd car parks that were being talked about at one stage, sure, it has, it has significant urban design implications as well because you're starting to load an awful lot of um, stuff onto the one site. And car parking isn't, you know, the most, be <laughs> the most beautiful feature in the world of <laughs> modern buildings. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take that point. I mean, the next question is one that really answers itself, I suppose. How does specifying an increased number of car parks uh, to be put into this development, how is that consistent with the other goals that we set for you of reducing emissions and reducing congestion? David. It struggles. <laughs> I think that's enough. That's Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I need to move an extension of time, please. Do I have a second, Deputy Chair? Thank you. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. That is passed. Um, David and Ross and um, Pete, Andrew, on behalf of Auckland Council, Ekepanuku and uh, Auckland uh, Transport, thank you. Uh, we're going to close the questions now and we are, we're now uh, got the motions. They've already moved and been moved and seconded. Um, now, I just want to go through these motions, please. Um, thank you to Councillor Casey. Councillor Casey, um, I think there's general acceptance of those changes. Councillor Coombe, I want to come to the points that you made um, and you'd like a just a brief definition of a bus facility to be bracketed there. I think we'll put that up. Now, members, I'm, I sense that there's an acceptance of better defining accessibility even though it's elsewhere, we're going to put it up for, and, and also to define or to, to identify accessibility and to um, briefly define the bus facility. So have we got the bus facility in red, please? Mayor, um, you're the, the second to this. You're 
you're um, agreeable to these yeah. small changes. And can I just clarify, I was having this on about with Megan, and I think I've landed on it myself, but in DI, I just want to make really clear that we've got the or in the right place because there are two different options. Either as part of the site redevelopment, so we redevelopment the site and or that can be with removing the flyover and replacing the space underneath it with a next it's it's I'm not convinced there's it's clear that it's either or in terms of the options because an extra and or is being put in <laughs> which okay. I understand where that is sitting but as long as we're sure that that's really clear there's an on-site option there's an off-site option the off-site option is either okay, or removing it. the flavor so um, just while we go to the next stage um, we um, have got the uh, bus facility identified in brackets there, and between our chief of strategy and um, and David Rankin, we'll just make sure, and Ross Chernside, we'll just make sure we've got that the the, um, the wording right there. Okay, now um, Councillor Watson, I've got an indication of. Do you still want to put an amendment? Do you? I think I members. How about we just take uh, the amendment now and um, and treat with that. Um, does that suit you, Councillor Watson? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm going to take um, now. I'm why I'm saying this is an amendment, Councillor Watson. I, I don't get a sense that there's um, you know a, enough consensus to to um, a, adopt it, incorporate it. So I will come to you to move it, and um, you will tell us who your second is, please. Thank you. Can you put your mic on, please, Councillor Watson? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that now. Thank you. Look, um, to be honest, folks, uh, I'm a little disturbed at the turn of events today and really how far these recommendations have moved away from all the advice that we received in the workshops leading up to now. And, and, I, and I hope this resonates with some of the people around the table. We started off uh, from uh, through Auckland Transport getting told how important it was for people to have access to the city centre to enable their contribution to and benef benefit from it. We, we tied that down when, in relation to the downtown car park in particular, and I'm, I'm quoting from one of our workshops here, where short stay parking supports the city centre's vibrancy and economy by increasing equitable access to recreation, culture events, retail and hospitality. And what that meant was that there was a place, a strategic place at the heart of Auckland City where people from all over Auckland can come to and get some parking. So we, we have said that and furthermore, uh, we, we very early on concluded that if AT was to continue that important role of equity, of allowing people to come in and go to events, these hundreds of millions of dollars that are invested down there, it was important that Auckland Transport uh, to provide uh, affordable short stay parking or at least to enable it in an instance like this by retaining space for car parking in downtown and that was seen as being absolutely essential. Um, and who are the people that came in and if someone referred to where they come from or how many of them were, there are big numbers of people from all over Auckland come in and use that parking for accessing those facilities at, at night and the weekend uh, when there is no other parking or very limited parking, particularly when we are looking to remove it. So they came from all over, thousands of people. There was um, uh, Waitakere, over uh, 5,000 people in just, just over um, a month and a half. Over 4,000 from Iraqi, North Shore, ironically enough. Mauna Kea Kea Tamaki, getting up to 4,000. The South, a, li a little less, but still up 2,000, going to 3,000. Um, Eden, Albert Eden, over 5,000. Albany Ward, over 6,000. So there are thousands and thousands of our people using that, and they're using it because it's not always practical to get, to get a bus in there, a family of five to get a bus in on a Friday night to go to a show. That's not really all that practical, as it is for people with mobility issues, as it is for the, for the elderly. Um, I think that in this issue, we should be listening to 
our people who have informed us through this, our experts, and that's the people in Auckland Transport, who have already reduced the number down from 1,290 um, to 690 to down to four to 700. For, you know, that is a big reduction already as things stand in those numbers of short-term parking, for providing that access for our people on the odd occasions that they choose to come in. Um, they, I heard a little bit of guffawing at um, the notion of the climate change objective, so I find that a little ironic. If you compare us internationally, for instance, with, with Glas Glasgow City, uh, which is light years ahead of Auckland in terms of uh, its climate change actions, not policies, actions, and its public transport provision, they faced exactly the same position, and in their city centre strategic parking review, their response was to cap the existing number. So they capped their permanent off-street parking at the existing number. They didn't reduce it by over of half what we are proposing to do. So that's a city that is leading the world in climate change and in public transport. Its heavy rail network is second only to Greater London. So that's what people are doing internationally. Uh, and that's what we should be following here. And, and to be fair to our Auckland transport officers is what they have been recommending us to do. So I, I, you know, to be honest, I'm very surprised to see that social good um, output from Auckland Transport in providing that affordable, safe off-street parking. There is a social component here. Do you really want women and young kids and whatnot wandering around the streets, waiting at bus terminals at half past 11 at night or 12 o'clock at night and trying to make connections that they won't make anyway in the outer suburbs, that's not really all that practical. So this particular facility, if we're to be true to that notion of providing equitable access to all these facilities in the downtown that our people pay for, that our ratepayers and other citizens pay for, then we should be providing an adequate amount. What Mr Rankin referred to a credible, actually credible and adequate, guess what, they mean the same thing. They mean the same thing and that is acceptable. So that's a common definition to both. So that resolution there kindly seconded by Councillor Stewart in effect, in effect is merely a restating of the assurance that was given to us by Mr Rankin when he spoke, when he used the word credible to say the same thing. The only difference is, rather than the, the rather um, uh, sort of glib dismissal of the adequate short stay that, that was in the motion at proper, that actually makes it clearer to the developers, to the business interests, that yes, we want to see what you're going to provide for your, your shoppers, but we also want to see what you're going to provide for the general public because that is important to us at this location, downtown Auckland. I think that is a reasonable assurance and it merely reflects everything we have been told throughout this entire process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, is there anybody else that would like to speak to this motion? Um, I think I'll take three speakers on either side, if, if that's OK. Councillor Walker. So uh, I'm speaking unequivocally in support of this motion. It is absolutely crucial that this city provides for the needs of disabled people. And we know that there are a lot of them, and with a growing city, there will be a lot more. And what do those disabled people need? Often. A number of these people are dependent on a vehicle. Sometimes it's a customised vehicle to meet their needs. Those disabled people normally have um, disabled stickers on their uh, cars and the like. They're identified. It's critical that we provide for them. And arguably, this is the single best location in the Auckland city area to provide for them. Now, why is that? because this particular location is close to the ferries, is close to what will be light rail, is close to heavy rail, is close to walking and cycling facilities. Not that they would be using that, but it is close to all of those facilities. So it is a critical location. The other comment that I would make is that 
if you're traveling in an electric vehicle, and everybody will be traveling, traveling in electric vehicles, from a climate change perspective, especially if that electric vehicle is full, it meets our climate change objectives better and faster than providing for buses. Because buses, especially diesel buses, if they are not very full, actually generate significantly more carbon than does a full electric vehicle. And electric vehicles are becoming more and more efficient. And increasingly, those electric vehicles will be powered by people who will be generating their electricity from solar off their roof. That is the way we are moving. And if we had to meet a climate emergency tomorrow, the best use we could make would be from the vehicle network with a maximum number of people using it. The other concern, as has been indicated, is there are many people around the outskirts of the city, and that also includes places like Great Barrier, Waiheke, but also our ward, the Albany Ward, Franklin, Rodney, that are completely dependent on driving a vehicle, hopefully an efficient vehicle, in order to get into the city because the public transport network doesn't support them and is not going to be supporting them, certainly in this long-term plan and probably the next long-term plan. So how else are they going to get into the city? Practically, from a retail perspective, if retailers want to sell product and people are going to buy that product and some of that product is bulky, how are they going to get that product home? Obviously, they can have it couriered, but many people want to pick something up and take it home. Also, as has been mentioned, if you've got a number of people going to an entertainment event, and often those events are social, what do those people do if they want cheap convenient transport and their carpooling. Let's say they're from South Auckland, for example. They're going to come in, in a vehicle, they're going to fill it, fill it to the max, and where are they going to park if they want to use public transport or go to an entertainment venue in the vicinity of Wynyard? They're going to park here. And in the future, we know that they're not going to be able to park in many other areas because this council and Auckland Transport is actively reducing the number of parks that are available on street. And further to that, the unitary plan we know, supported by the National Policy Statement for Urban Development, has zero provision, zero provision for parking for apartments. We don't know what that reality is going to look like into the future. We don't know that. But is it not sensible to make a provision now. And we have been told by Auckland Transport that we can have a building design that is flexible so we can give over more space to short stay parking in the interim with the flexibility of changing that into the future. And as Mr Rankin acknowledged, given the strategic nature of this building and its strategic um, location, it follows that we should be preserving that option. But we can only preserve that option, and I would repeat, only preserve that option, if we actually generate a specification. So are we going to do that based on the information, the good information that we've received from Auckland Transport, or are we going to abrogate our responsibility and just give it over to the uh, marketplace? And as Mr Rankin mentioned, I think he mentioned a figure as low as 50. I'm sure that was in jest, but that was the range or the lower end of the range that he mentioned. So this amendment is entirely reasonable. It actually doesn't specify an amount, but it does refer to the, to the objectives of the development and the provision of adequate short stay parking for the use of the general public. That's what it reads. Obviously, that will be informed by Auckland Transport, I would hope. What could be wrong with that? 
So I would urge councillors to vote for what is an incredibly sensible and pragmatic amendment. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Just briefly from me, um, you've heard from our General Manager of uh, Plans and Places that in our own document that uh, we signed up in 2016, there are, there are no minimum provisions for car parking in the city centre. Um, I think um, that continues to stand, that's my understanding. It's, it seems um, a real contradiction of us uh, if we were to proceed and ask the private sector for something that was quite different to the unitary plan provisions. Uh, that would be really, um, I, I don't know how you could reconcile the two actually. I think the, the market would just be scoffing at us. Uh, it's an unexplainable contradiction, to be honest, um, requiring that. Um, and I just do want to emphasise um, we are in no way restricting any proposer, any, pr any proposal that comes forward. Uh, we're not restricting them on providing um, car parking, uh, and that's entirely consistent with the unitary plan. Um, I also remind people that um, this particular part of our city centre square mile is not just connected by public transport, it's hyper-connected. It's got bus, it's got rail. Uh, it's going to have future um, CRL. It's going to likely have future light rail. We're just about to open a brand spanking new downtown ferry terminal. We're, we've got so much in the budget to expand that network, uh, it is going to be even more hyper-connected, and that's what re people are responding to. And we've had the evidence before us that the growth is in public transport and active transport connections for people reaching the city centre. That's what they're thirsting for, and that's what they're climbing aboard. Um, Councillor Walker, absolutely respectfully, uh, you talked about disabled people need this. Um, Councillor Casey emphasised the need to re-emphasise, actually, uh, um, the, the desire for accessibility. To make it explicit, we've done that again. Um, that is already provided for. You spoke uh, about this place providing, you know, rail, heavy rail, etc. I think you found yourself speaking against the motion there, actually, uh, and, and just reinforcing that it is absolutely hyper-connected. Um, I'll go now to Councillor Coon. Um. Thank you, Mr Chair. I would rather be speaking in support of the substantive item, but I'm going to take strength from all of what our local board said this morning, because I really have to just respond to this amendment, which is so inconsistent with our strategies and our plans that we've put in place. And they've, they've, we should back our own plans that we have for the city centre. Um, just a few things that I just wanted to really respond in terms of locking in car parking. That is a, a solution to yesterday's problem, or today's problem. And this isn't about whether people should be able to drive into the city centre. That's always going to be a necessity, whether it's going to be in EVs in the future. There will be people who will need to drive. Just as we know today, there's plenty of people that find it easier to drive into the city centre. But we're talking about Councillor Walker, Councillor Watson, the city in 2028. We've got to imagine what that's like when CRL has opened, when light rail is running from the city centre, when we have more ferries, we have electric ferries. The city is going to be really different. They're going to be people fountains. It's going to be so easy to access this part of the city. For us to lock in today's problem into the future of the city is so short-sighted. And that is what Auckland has always done. We're governors around this table because we're here to make decisions for the future generations as well. Not to like build harbour bridges that are only four lanes when we know that the future actually needed eight. So um, it just does not make sense at all that we lock in requirements around car parking, especially when we know any developer is going to go to market and say, this is what customers need. They will come up with car parks. We know as a minimum it's going to be at least 200 because that's what the current, um, one of the, you know, the precinct already have locked in that car park is 200 car parks that they need for commercial bay. So that will be part of the mix. And they're, they're, sh they're going to probably add in, there'll be more if that's what the market needs. But this is for 2028. And I also just want to refer to something that's in the report at paragraph 120. 118. The full financial implications of the redevelopment will not be known until you know the, the competitive market process. But 
adding in all of this stuff will have a material impact on the value of the site. We might as well be writing a check to any developer that comes along if we start prescribing all this additional stuff and prescribing short-term car parks, which are the most the lowest value use of this site in 2028. So I get the intention, I get the concern about today, I totally understand that people need to drive in today. That, that's, this is about enabling the future when Aucklanders are gonna have a whole lot more options and we've got a plan for that. So there's just no way that this should be supported and I really, I don't need to speak to the substantive item because I, I think I've made my points. Um, and I just really think we've got to a good place with this report um, and we should go to market and test it to see what the value is. And I think it's really good that we have options on the table so we can find out what we can actually ma maximise from the site. And I just make a final comment that this is the most amazing opportunity for this site. And I might have said this last time when we had that shamozzle of a meeting when we tried to get this across the line last time, but... I never imagined in my lifetime that we would see this development, this downtown car park site get developed and that we might get rid of the flyover that was built for a motorway that was going to decimate our waterfront and go across eastern bays. That's why that flyover is there. It serves no other purpose. So we've got to reimagine what our city is and the city centre master plan gives us a fantastic um, foundation for that. So I'm really glad that it's been led now by Panuku by our strategic team because that's the best way that we can put our front foot forward to go to the market and we've got to make sure we get the best deal for the people of Auckland and this amendment will undermine that. So kia ora, thank you. Thank you Councillor Coombe. Um, Meg off please. Thanks, I can be brief because I think the points have been made but let me just reiterate the critical ones. Uh, the importance of access to the city centre, Councillor Watson raised as his primary point. This area of the city is better connected by public transport than any other part of the city by a country mile. The area that we're talking about, the downtown car park, is 200 metres from the Britomart, 200 metres from the ferry, it has the buses connecting in there, and in due course we hope it will have light rail connecting in there. Secondly, uh, will this mean no cars can come into the city centre? Of course not. Uh, when I think of that area, you've got two large car parks immediately adjacent to the downtown car park, the Fanshawe Street car park and the, uh, the Viaduct Basin car park. So there will still be car parks there. The second point is about opportunity costs if we prescribe the number of car parks. Firstly, um, one of the critical things about the sale of this asset uh, is that it will help meet our sales target, it will meet our savings target, and some of that money can be recycled into vital assets. The more we load onto the developer, the more we lower the value of the property and the return to council. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think um, uh, our officers have specified the exact amount, but the more we load onto it, the less we'll get for it. And secondly, uh, to pick up uh, David Rankin's point, you know, we're taking away a car park to create something totally different, and now we're trying to load more and more onto the site where we want to create something different, more and more car parks. Thirdly, um, inconsistency with our existing policies. Um, the Chair has talked about the unitary plan. Reducing emissions is critical. Look, um, we'll, th there'll be 50% of our buses that will be electric long before there'll be 50% of our private vehicles. Uh, and then there's the question of congestion, and for every double-decker bus that we bring into this area, you take 100 cars off the road. How can we say we want to lower congestion, discourage cars from coming in, cut emissions, and then decide that we're going to be prescriptive in, in calling for more and more car parks to be put on this site? Um, the goal that we've got of pedestrianising the site is not compatible with bringing more and more cars into this part of the city centre. Um, I think the last point that I want to make is uh, we shouldn't be micromanaging what's happening with this development. Uh, we are putting it on the market. We are expecting the developer to also to respond to what that developer thinks there might be demand for. And one of the great ironies is that we could end up prescribing a number of car parks that the developer would have, would have put in anyway, but the difference is that that will now be discounted off the price of the property that we're selling. Uh, 
I did say the last point, but I, I need to bring up the point about disabled. I don't think we should hide behind disabled folk on this one. Um, you know, the people that use the car park now in the downtown car park area, um, I don't know what the exact ratio is, but I'd imagine that for each disabled person driving a car in, you'd have 100, maybe 200 people that were not disabled. If we are concerned about the disabled, and we should be, then we require uh, that these sites are accessible from the public transport point of view, and Councillor Casey has moved that, but we also have it within our power, of course, uh, to prescribe um, set places for, for disabled people in our other public car parks. I'm not sure that we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I have had three speakers against. I'll go to Councillor Stewart um, to speak. Uh, and I think in favour of the motion. OK, well, I'm definitely, anyway, I've seconded it, so I'm definitely supporting it. But I was just picking up on a few of the things. My husband and I were talking about a lot of people that want to come into the city to go out to dinner as a couple or with other friends and everything. They're not going to go and get public transport. If we, if we come into dinner, into the city, we like to drive somewhere, we like to park our car and we might like to be able to get home. I know people that have re tried relying on public transport and, and if they've waited for taxis and there hasn't been a taxi or they've missed the bus or whatever, people, when, they, when they're all dressed up and they're wanting to go out to dinner and they want to support our businesses in the, in, in the CBD, they want to be able to be able to come in and park for a couple of hours. They want short-term parking. And I think, you know, we, we're being very short-sighted of the business people. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Um, members, um, I've got three speakers in favour and three against. Now, point, okay, I've got a closure motion now. Do you have a second, though, Councillor Point of order. I'm sorry, I've got a move and a second, so I have to, I've got a motion on the table now. Point of order, um, and I'll Chair. take the take the point of order. Yeah, just seeking your ruling on I, on 1.4.3 of the standing orders. If three speakers have spoken consecutively in support of or in opposition to, so just drawing your attention to the word consecutively there, and that that hasn't occurred in this debate. I'll just I'll just check on that, please. But I, right now I've got a closure motion, and I have to I'll check on the the standing order, and then I'll check on the closure motion. Okay, so in terms of a, the chairperson's acceptance of a closure motion, um, standing order 1.6.7, the chairperson may accept a closure motion where there have been at least two speakers for and two speakers against the motion. So he is able to accept that if he believes it's reasonable. Just a point of order, Mr Chair, just speaking to that ex explanation, which is a very good one. So may indicates that it's in your hands, so you can accept it or not. Yes, and look, I'm going to accept uh, the closure motion, um, knowing how much business we've got to conclude and uh, considering the debate that we've had on this so far and will continue to have uh, with the substantive motion. So, put, so point of order, Mr Chair, just on the closure motion, then obviously anyone that wanting to, to continue speaking will vote against the motion. It's yes, the motion is, is moved. It is seconded, moved by Councillor Cooper and seconded by the Deputy Mayor. It's a closure motion, and I believe um, there's no further discussion on a closure motion. Yeah. So I will now take that to the vote. All those in favour say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Aye. Okay, um, um, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a show of hands, please. In the affirmative, could you please raise your right hand? This is for, for the closure motion. It is. It is for. Okay. I'm happy to chair uh, if you I, like. I, I, I support the motion, um, uh, Chris. It's Greg online. I guess we've got 10. Thank you. Same here. Excuse, excuse me. Members, can I. Do you mind if I chair? <laughs> can you please raise your right hand if you are in favour of the closure motion? And I'll allow Kalinda to do the counting, please. Okay, so we have the members in the room. There is currently four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, four. The motion, um, and Councillor Sayers, are you are you voting on the closure motion? 
No, no, I'd, I'd like to speak to it, so I'd be against it. Okay, all right. Okay, and so do you want to put it against? And against, Sorry, please. Chair. Just a minute, please. Chair, just to let you know. Sorry, Chair, sorry, Chair I, I for sorry, the pleasure Councilor of making Elf, we're, in the of, yes. we're in the middle of voting, Councillor Elf, and, um, I just Are you saying that you are voting in favour, Councillor Elf? Yes, that's why I wanted to, to, to inform you, Chair. Oh, look, thank you. Sorry for my interruption there, but um, so, so it is vote. 10. Those against, please raise their right hand in the room. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight against. Are there any online against? Um, and Councillor Mulholland is against. So we're so okay. Ten, um, so the the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Um, so we'll oh, now put the amendment to the vote. I just so just point of order on the numbers. Yeah, I, th I thought it was ten eight. Then two other people opposed it. So you're using your casting I'll, vote, are you? No, I'll hand to Kalinda to tell you what the vote decision is. So I had it as ten but, councillors. Can I just check my vote was included in that, Chris, please? Can we, we've got the record of the vote, and we've oh, heard sorry. you, Councillor Sayers and Councillor Philip Piner. And oh, Kalinda. Sorry, I didn't count Councillor Sayers, so we're currently at a tie. So, therefore, the status quo will have to go, which means that we continue the debate on the motion, uh, on the amendment. Okay, I'm just going to clarify that. You, you're confident so, of the vote count, please? Yeah, because. Councillor Sayers was voting against and I didn't count him. And you counted Councillor Filipina? Yes. In favour of the motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and it's, so and, there's no, and there's no casting vote on this. No. Correct. Okay, thank you. So we'll continue with the debate and that's now with Councillor Hills. This is only on the amendment, please. Cool, so I, the, I'm against this amendment because it's specifying things that we have discussed at several workshops that we weren't going to specify. This is what we plan to do and supported through the City Centre Master Plan. If you put a whole bunch of car parks in there, we cannot do that. The unitary plan says requires developers of zero car parks in this space, so why would we require this um, developer to do the same? We've been told that Auckland Council and Auckland Transport and Panuku are not going to own or run these car parks, so even if we require someone, the developer, to put these car parks in. We will not own or run or charge out these car parks. We have been told that the more, re more, re the more we require, the more we have to pay for or loss. This is two or three, if you include the buses, outcomes. The city centre master plan outcome, which was this whole design, which has been gone out to consultation, the, the, the outcomes for that, and then also the other outcome is Councillor Simpsons um, and the rest of us have agreed um, for the uh, disposals. And so we're going to make this job harder and harder for Ross when we complain every time uh, that you know only 90 million of the 244 have been sitting there. This is a big part of that, but also the buses, the development, the, yeah. So w I don't understand why we would suddenly require a whole bunch of car parks in a building that will not be ours. And once again, this, is, this building currently contains only 6% of the car parking in Auckland City. We are not suddenly wiping out all the car parks in the city centre. And also, this building is likely to open between 2028 and 2030 or something like that. There will be five or six years where we have no car parking at all in this space. And then suddenly, after six years, we will turn that back on and expect the same. That is, that is not the outcome we have agreed to in the City Centre Master Plan or anything else up to this. Thank you, Councillor Hills and Councillor Henderson, your call. Thank you, Chair. I'll just be very brief. Um, so Councillor Coombe and the Mayor have really nailed this and Councillor Hills as well. I want to speak in support of their corridor in speaking against the motion. I just add to their um, words, the Council is just not in a position to take unders on such valuable real estate as this. Speaking as DP Chair of the Finance Committee, we take a cut price on an asset like this, that's money not being spent on renewing our pools, on our parks, on our community centres, on our libraries, on all the things that, Auckland, that makes Auckland a great place to live. So let's concentrate on getting the best deal for the people of Auckland. Thank you. Thank you. And the Deputy Mayor, please. No, no, thanks. <laughs> 
<laughs> Councillor Simpson. Yeah, look, I, um, I think you're both saying the same thing in some respects. This doesn't give a minimum number. I don't really have a problem with the amendment, and I've checked with my colleagues, I don't think they really have a problem with it either. First of all, the first point, is responses to include the details of the car parking required to meet the objectives of the development. That's exactly the same words as in D3. But responses to include details of the car parking required to meet the objectives of the development. Exactly the same words. Then they've added, and the provision of adequate short-stay parking for the use of the general public. Well. We don't know what that is. Let's see what they say. It's not a minimum number. And this says, the original one says, and any additional public short-stay car parking they propose to provide. Okay. So actually, I, I just don't see a problem. It's not a minimum number. Look, you know, it's, it's let's see. I talked to Ross and I talked to David. What's going to happen? You know, I asked the question, is this the last decision? It, and, and Megan, I asked this question to you too, and your initial answer to me was, no, it's not. This sets the framework. What happens then is that they will come to workshops with us and explain what they are talking with with the proposal around that development. We will see that. We will have an, I, I just think, actually, you're getting all upset. They, no one said it has to be 300, 400, 500, 600. Well, let's just have a look and see what it is. It's not a problem. I don't have a problem with it. And final speaker is Councillor Collins. Thanks, Chair. I, I just want to, and thanks for, for those of you who kept the, the debate open. Um, Democracy. Yeah, and, and that's cool, because like, I could have spoken in the substantive. I just wanted to share how confused I'm feeling at the moment. <laughs> and I thought that might add something to, to the discussion. I'm, I'm really grateful, in particular, to Councillors Watson and Coombe, because I think they've presented, both presented very compelling arguments. Uh, and then, you know, Councillor Hills spoke, and I, and then I started leaning one way, and now Councillor Simpson, I'm all over the place at the moment. But I think one of the things that I wanted to say was we are bound to our our urgency around climate action, and I wasn't here the day that was unanimously voted for, but I I am bound by that, and I would have voted in favour. But one of the considerations that I make that given that South Aucklanders aren't coming in their droves and cars. Uh, to park in this parking space is that one of the challenges I've always felt for more vulnerable, poorer communities in particular is the way we take them on the journey. And if we were to go from, uh, what, 1,200 car parks, whatever it is, to zero or to 300, 400, possibly 700, I'm wondering what that journey is like for communities like mine. And so that's, the, that's, that's probably what is at top of mind for me is that it's often easy, well, no, it's not easy, but it, it seems really practical and the right thing to do to be in, encouraging our communities to look at active and public transport, but it's often not the case for my community. They're still extremely car dependent and they're car dependent on cars that are gas guzzlers and I want them to get out of them, but I just, I'm just thinking through going to, to a much less or, or signaling that there's gonna be so many fewer such, fewer car parks, whether that's the way you take them on the journey. So that's, I just wanted to express that as being my confusion at the moment. And I wanted to thank councillors, because I think, you know, whilst there was a bit of um, niggle around the edges of the ruck there, I think that the, the arguments that people have presented, I've really learned from, I'm, and I really appreciate, and I'm, I'm grateful for the way you've guided the discussion, Chair, because I know it's difficult, and there were two times where you asked if you were allowed to chair, and I just wanted to say you are more than welcome to chair. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Collins. Thank you for that contribution, and um, oh, I've got Councillor Fletcher now online. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, I don't think what my I, vote... What for extending the um, debate, in which case it wouldn't have been a tie. Um, I, I'm not sure what happened to my technology. But um, I, I probably am following on from observations that Councillor Simpson has made, in that I, I actually see this as reflecting the policy advice we've received from David Rankin. As we go through the, um, and I applaud um, the councillors who have put this amendment forward, because we do need, as we go through the divestment of such a significant piece of downtown, we do need to take our public with us and give them confidence that we understand what 
you know, what needs to be considered in terms of fairness, and and that we have transitionary measures. Um, I I have to say I disagree with those that say that they know that that will just discount the price. I would like to see evidence of that. Once upon a time, people said, oh, well, we have to bowl away all our heritage because that will discount the value of, of this site or that site. I think into the future, um, a, a smart developer will understand that there will be value from making sure that there is adequate provision. So I, I don't buy into that argument. It does concern me that unless there is adequate short-term parking, um, we may unintentionally favour big business over small business. We know that there are uh, a, a small law practices, that, that there are small professionals who are working in that area who rely on that downtown car park for people coming in and having um, access. They they may not be the big Russell McVeighs and the Simpson Grierson's that can provide their clients with uh, car parks in inside of, of buildings. So um, long term, that developer will know and be smart enough that those car parks, if they're not required, can probably be modified into something else. But this is the one chance that we have today to actually ensure that the reflection of the, the things that we've heard from our communities, and this is very much a political vote. This isn't anything other than applying our political judgment on all the advice we've heard. This is our responsibility today. And I believe what Councillor Watson is attempting to do is to reflect what we have heard, that there will be adequate short stay parking. Yes, we're, we're moving into the great future and we will have, you know, the Britomart was always intended to be linked to the CRL. We will have fantastic accessibility into the downtown area, but there will always need to be some short stay parking. And I think that those smaller businesses uh, that are there will need to hear that we're still considering them in the decisions that we're making for the future as we go to divest ourselves of, of this premier site. So I'm supporting Councillor Watson in this. And I, 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 I would hate to think that uh, just on points of principle that others won't support him because I think I think it's just reinforcing what we've heard by way of policy workshops and, and in policy advice that we've heard today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Sayers, please. Councillor Sayers, are you with us? Okay, members, I'm going to put it to the vote then. Uh, we're going to the vote now. And um, I ask all by those division. in favour say aye. By, by division. Okay, I've got a division now. Um, I'll hand to the Governance Advisor. Okay. So this is a division on the amendment that's up on the screen um, to D3. Um, Councillor Darby. Against. Councillor against. Bartley. Um, against. Councillor Casey. No. Councillor Cashmore. Uh, no. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Coombe. Against. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Dalton. Against. Councillor Filipina. Against. Councillor Fletcher. Four. Mayor Goff. No. Um, Councillor Henderson. No. Councillor Hills. Against. Councillor Mulholland. She's against. Against. Okay. against. Councillor Sayers, who's not online, sorry. Um, Councillor Simpson. Councillor Stewart. <laughs> Councillor Walker. <laughs> Councillor Watson. <laughs> Councillor Young. Um, I think Councillor Sayers has just returned online. Councillor Sayers, can you hear yes, us? Thank you. For, for the motion. For the motion. Okay. For the motion? Yes, we've got your vote. Thank you. It's lost by eight months to 
The motion is lost by eight votes to 13. We'll go to the substantive motion. Um, Mayor Goff, would you like to um, speak to the substantive, please? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, um, Mr Chairman. Um, let's just go back to the, the wider picture because I think we've been buried in the weeds for a while. Um, what we're doing with this paper on top of the one that we've already passed is being one step away from being able to put in front of the public uh, a proposal that we will transform what David Rankin quite rightly described as the prime remaining central city downtown site. Um, what we're doing is we're replacing a shabby, a seismic challenged, uh, past its use by date, uh, building in the wrong place uh, with the potential for a world class uh, uh, construction of retail office and possibly accommodation space that really connects Commercial Bay, which is now a wonderful area, with Viaduct Basin, which is also a wonderful area, and why the hell would we want to leave a redundant uh, and unaesthetic uh, car park in the middle of those two great areas of the city? Um, the outcome, of course, will be determined by a market process, which is uh, appropriate uh, to, to determine what, what is the best outcome architecturally, uh, and in terms of usage, and the best financial return. And uh, financial return is balanced uh, also against that outcome. I think we're going for a great outcome that's consistent with the, uh, the Central City Master Plan, but obviously it also has the potential for a really good financial return that enables us to achieve our savings targets and to transfer investment to more important areas. The paper that we're looking at now, um, first of all, it, it it determines that we do need a bus facility, and uh, I acknowledge the work that's been done on that. Uh, there are a lot of people, and an increasing number of people, that will be coming in by bus, and we want them to be able to have a place where they can uh, properly embark and disembark. We're putting in front of the, the people who will be tendering two choices, one within the building and the other on street, but I think the opinion around this uh, table is pretty clear. Uh, that the advantage, uh, as we see it, would be on an on-street site that doesn't uh, rip maybe 30 or 40 per cent of the value out of the sale of the building, but still meets the needs that we require. Um, what we've decided in the last debate is that um, the developer, uh, him or herself, will determine uh, what the nature of the car parking spaces will be, and we as a council will not be subsidising car parking by discounting our price by setting a requirement for a number of, uh, a particular number of car parks. And quite importantly, um, it provides for a, flexi a flexible and multi-modal transport hub. So I think after a long period of workshopping and committee meetings and uh, uh, somebody called it a schmozzle on the Thursday before Easter, which we all remember well. We never want to repeat that again. Uh, I think we've arrived in a place that um, I hope that the overwhelming majority of councils can agree with. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Cooper, please. Kind of you, very kind. Um, so I did have my reservations about parking um, for commuting, but we're talking about short-stay car parking here. And short-stay car parking is not usually random. It's something you think, I've got to go into town for a couple of hours, I've got to do this. Though, I think for most people in the outer suburbs, they're not coming into their lawyer in the city. And if they are, they can afford whatever it is. Um, people from places like Ranui and Newland, Henderson, can all come in the train and from the south if they're doing something like that. In terms of the other, I, I, I want to support Councillor, um, both Councillor Henderson and Councillor Simpson in terms of what we value we can get out of this building. Because when we um, got less value out of the CAB that a lot of elected members didn't like, we were highly criticised and it was all through the papers that we'd given away buildings. I don't want to do that. I want to get the best value out of this and the best outcome for the city. Um, I also think that, you know, what we're all changing the way we do things, even an old crusty like me from the West, 
we'll get the ferry in from Hobsonville Point if we're coming in for a few drinks and a show, whatever it is, and then we'll Uber home and we'll share it with four people. So, so in terms of the kinds of journeys that Councillor Stewart was talking about, for people that can come in to the city and afford to have a meal and do all those sorts of things, go to a show, we can afford an Uber. But for most people nowadays, they use their services locally. They go to the lawyer, they go to things locally. And so not a lot of people, except if they're shopping at maybe um, Commercial Bay, um, come in. And those people can afford to pay for parking. But they could also come in on a train or other places like that because it's usually a leisure time thing. So for me, this is really critical. I, I also don't understand why we would need to put numbers to the car park spaces because this is completely part of getting the value out of it. We can ask those questions when this comes back to us. We can ask those questions of the proposal. We can say how many short stay car parks. We can ask those things. But, you know, at the moment, it's a bit more high level than that. And I'd like to let this process go ahead, get it out to whoever wants to buy it and realise some value, but also realise some of the aspirations we have for our city centre. There's no point spending a whole lot of money on Key Street and making it pedestrian friendly and then having it full of cars and a horrible flyover, which is not a nice place to walk either. So I support um, this and I'm glad we've got to it finally. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper and Councillor Dalton. Thank you, and I will be quick. Um, I support this too, and really I'm speaking to all the people behind me, but it would be awkward if I turned around. Um, I just want to thank them for all of the advice and their guidance to get us to this point, and I wasn't here from the very beginning. But, um, but like Councillor Collins, every day is a learning day, right? And today was a learning day, just to hear all the different points of view. Um, Look, the message I just want to say to everyone behind me is build it for all of Auckland. I have heard some views around today by the surrounding boards, Devonport Takapuna, Auraki, Waitamata, but build it for all of Auckland uh, because we will go through that, well, it's probably six years, I think you said, that it, until it's possibly built. The CRL will be online. Things would have changed a great deal. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I think it's important that we don't actually specify a number. I think uh, I think that is very wisely and cleverly worded because uh, it sort of gives a, a, a clear direction that we're not going to be uh, not going to be limiting what happens there or opening it up. So build it for people who can't access public transport, people who come here on the weekends or come here to study. Uh, or for, for whatever reason that they can't get on to, uh, they have to bring their cars here because uh, they can't do the multimodal modal way at the moment. And I, actually, I do think it's great that we finally find a home for a bus facility. Um, I would also like to support Cathy, um, including our Councillor Casey Bank, just making sure it's explicit about accessibility because disabil uh, providing for disability is a, is a requirement. But I think by being a bit more explicit about it, we're just saying, just go a little bit further with that and, and make it as accessible as possible for all of our people that um, come through. So thank you for all of the work and um, thank you for all of the debate and discussion today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dalton. And uh, Deputy Mayor, please. Thanks. Chair, and um, well done. Challenging afternoon. So you look at the Auckland plan, it looks to a future mm. that is carbon minimalised as much as possible and is decongested as much as possible. Look at our unitary plan, it doesn't provide for car parking in the inner city amongst buildings. We've seen pictures and images of what this potential building site could look like, and it's about as different as what it is now as possibly could be. Eight years is a long time. We might not be driving at all in the inner city or in the inner villages at all. We'll be using micromobility or um, dial-up car services that are fully electric or minivans. God knows how it's going to change. At the Infrastructure Commission's two-day seminar I've been to on uh, 
past two days this week, what we did learn was that the world is going to be vastly different. We're going to meet our carbon targets. We're going to have to get rid of 50% of our automobiles. And the remaining 50% will have to be electric. Hydrogen is, is, is another 20 to 30 years away. We're going to have to physically change the way we live. And it's this vote to support this initiative now is a vote for the future, not a vote for the populist past. And we have to get over that. Councillors, you really do. Let's vote for the future here, for a good design. I'm going to trust the developers who are putting their coin in the game to make it work, not for us to put our, our pitiful spoon against the tide. So, Mr Chair, I urge support for this. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there other contributors? Councillor Hills. Uh, kia ora. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I really love this job, even when today we have, you know, disagreement and things, because this is actually making decisions that will affect, you know, if you go down to Te Wananga and see those almost 200 trees already in place, like that decision was made a long time ago, and, and slowly that is coming into place. Being down there now and seeing how busy it is, a commercial bay, Britomart, the people around during um, the America's Cup, but also just any night and event, the people that are starting to live in the city centre and around our town centres that we're upgrading, but lots of that takes so long. Hurstmere Road, uh, Chris, in our ward is, is you know decades old in the planning, but it's finally getting done. So I think it's important that we are trying to look as far out as possible while also taking on board all the really important feedback of people concerned with the rate of change that sometimes it feels like we're going in. My my. Just basic um, points, I guess, are if this was a public uh, development, I'd be totally worried about the details of car parking and whatever else was in it. But the, 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 the argument is whether we are selling this building for a development or we are keeping it in its current form. We're not keeping it in our current form and we won't own any part of it. I think it's going to be an amazing development, um, no doubt. Who wouldn't want to add to what's already additional down there. My weird uh, comments earlier about the space between there and uh, Wolf Street and that, you know, you can tell that in the early 1900s they cut up half of that city block to fit those eight lanes and flyovers and other things in there. I guess my point was that hopefully we're thinking of the broader little precinct there so we could put the bus terminal in with potentially apartments and other other uses in that space to make it even more interesting and more well used and potentially even get more revenue from um, from the sale and from the development. So although I know we're not all going to agree because we're not designers, engineers, and we're never going to be able to design this ourselves, but I think it would be wrong at this point in time to require car parks, uh, require someone in their private development, which it will be, to have a certain number of things that we actually shouldn't be requiring. So. I think it's going to be awesome, but I have enjoyed the debate today because it's actually pretty, it's pretty big stuff. Maybe some other people it's not, but this is kind of big future decision making for our city. And at some point in 10 years, there will be a whole lot of people enjoying that space um, down there from the decisions we made today. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Fletcher, are you with us online? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. I, I, I agree that this is a really important day, and I think the last time we had a really um, wholesome debate of this kind was when we were considering the sale of QE2 Square. And it is an opportunity for us to visualise how the, the future might be. And so um, there's no um, th there's no loss uh, in the time that we've committed to actually debating this today. But I... The last meeting we had left me very dissatisfied because it took having literally a tantrum to get um, the formality in and around the bus terminal. You know, if we'd gone on the recommendations and if we'd just rushed it through last time, we would not have given the attention that was required uh, to the provision um, of, of bus services in the downtown area. And to a degree, I feel we're making the same mistake in terms of the provision of car parking. Cars are on their way out. I'm the first to agree with it. But we're going through a transitional phase 
And I think the public are trusting us to make sure that there is some provision there. And, and just as when you go to an architect and you're going to design a building, and yes, it's a building we won't own, but this is our last opportunity today to actually make clarity around the brief of what we want. And I do not subscribe to those who think that we're just discounting the price. Um, I, I, th I think that that is somewhat spurious by way of argument. However, um, out of the shamozzle, I think Papakum came up with the shamozzle term, and I think it was quite appropriate, we came up with a better outcome. And I would implore you uh, to, to think about this is our chance, this is our last chance as governing body members and, and members of the IMSB to think about the future and think about the responsibility we have for what is a tired old space and how it can be given new life, but in such a way that it transitions us and actually can work for the future. So I'm, I'm not persuaded uh, by the arguments. I think that we are not delivering on our responsibilities by not actually taking into account um, the, it's not like we're increasing car parking, this is, is, it's less than half in terms of what they are talking about by way of short term parking. And the only, you know, by voting out the adequacy um, provision, I, I think it, it almost lends itself to zealotry that we're more about persuading ourselves that we're going to be the, the great warriors into the future rather than how can we persuade Aucklanders to come with us on this journey and how can we ensure that they trust us that we are hearing them. So for me, I, I can't support this today. I think we've squandered the opportunity to get this 100% right. This is our opportunity to define the brief, to give our instructions to the officers as to what we want negotiated. And I'm really disappointed that we're not making the most of that opportunity for our public. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Walker, please. So, uh, um I'm certainly disappointed. Um, I see increasingly a situation where this council abrogates its planning role, increasingly makes uh, decisions that are insufficiently f informed around uh, the evidence. I see conflict amongst our council controlled organisations. I think that Auckland Transport have made uh, an attempt to provide that um, information. but. Increasingly, short-term economics, the rush to um, sell, accounting against, I would suggest, the long-term interests of, um, of Auckland. Um, increasingly, I see a future that is no longer decently and in order, but is, is rushing to um, a future without sufficiently informing itself. I think that if we were to um, foresight and back cast, we are still going to have uh, vehicles. There's an enormous amount of investment that's going into the generation of electric vehicles. Increasingly, you'll see that they're wedded to battery sites um, on storage and solar. And if you're talking about climate change, those changes meet our objectives in large part. Not everybody is going to be using public transport into the future. It's an impossibility given the very spread out nature of Auckland. People may not own that vehicle. They may share it with others. And if we were to do some foresighting and the like, we will see those models being rolled out. And I think that Auckland Transport has done some work around that and should be informing us more around what that future is because there's a great deal of predictability about it. So what I come back to is a circumstance where there is an incredibly strategic asset here that's in the hub of our transport network. We do have a circumstance where vehicles are a part of that transport network and are a vital part into the future. And that does not involve investment on council's part. That involves the private marketplace. And here we are, abrogating our planning responsibility. So I'm, I'm disappointed here, and I see this decision once again as being a reflection 
on the downward slide of this council to really address the implementation, actually doing stuff that matters. In no way are we going to meet our climate change um, goals on the path that we are following now, because we're actually closing off options into the future that we need to meet them. Thank you. Thank you. Other speakers, members? Look, I'll just close this out then. Firstly, thanking our team for working on this over the last, um, I think it's, for the team it's coming up to about eight months. Uh, for us around this table, it's um, actually six months. It's almost six months to the day um, since we first uh, considered this item and we considered it again at uh, Finance and Performance. We considered it back here, um, uh, and this is the fourth time uh, it's come before committee. So I think it's been very thoroughly uh, socialised politically. Um, we've also had a work, couple of workshops on it, um, and there's been immense opportunity, and members, uh, you've received a lot of emails inviting you to lodge questions, and many of you have, lo have taken advantage of that. So whatever, however this has landed for you personally as, as a member of this uh, committee, thank you for all the contributions and uh, a lot of the ideas have been well tested and whatever side you're on, um, it's been a good constructive discussion all round over those six months. There's a tremendous opportunity here, as um, Mr Rankin outlined, you know, somewhat out of sequence, but maybe we didn't even have a sequence. Maybe we never thought we'd come to be considering the downtown car park or, or the flyover removal. Uh, we just had it in a in the city centre master plan with real no budget to go to it. Um, but here we are, we're responding in part to the private sector who's actually responding, which is responding to our, our strategic document, our city centre master plan. They're seeing what we've been saying over the years and they're going, well, we can fit into that. But of course, we need to take it to the general market. And um, my, one of those parties is appearing to be a, a front runner. Let's say they're appearing because we will go to a number uh, and, and elicit some great responses from a wider market. It really does present an opportunity for a, quite a decisive step change in the uh, downtown west area. Uh, I've always identified that flyover, that Fanshawe Street flyover, is just a great dislocator between uh, downtown central and going towards Viaduct, which leads you into the exciting Wynyard Quarter. There's a real impervious layer through there at the moment. This provides that uh, impetus to activate the laneway network that we identified in the City Centre Master Plan. Um, there's a lot of exciting potential here. Um, when we, I don't think we've ever uh, identified our strategic outcomes that we expect from this development, which are all consistent with other strategic documents. All the strategic outcomes that we've um, we've identified here in our former resolutions and today are at a level that are entirely consistent with all those bigger strategic documents that we've got on the table that we're all signed up to. And there's an expectation now that we hand this to the market and that they respond uh, accordingly. I actually think it's we should get ready to be surprised. I think we're going to be excited. Our senses are going to be excited by what the market might present back to us. Um, I certainly um, am very open to being surprised by what they come back with. Surprise positive. Um, and finally, I'd probably like to say that um, the development outcomes that could be delivered here need to be, as Councillor Dalton has reminded us, need to be what's best for all of Auckland. Uh, it is not just about our bottom line. It is definitely not about the bottom line of the proposer, that those that might come back. It has got to be about what fits holistically. And, and front and centre has got to be those strategic outcomes. Um, so I look forward to Akepanuku and our teams uh, dealing with the, the private sector now, and in a few months we'll see the product of that. I thank everybody again, staff, uh, but particularly everybody around this table for their really constructive contributions to uh, the place that we're about to land with these motions, and I will put them to the vote. So, can we take it on a show of hands? Division, please. I have a call for a division, and I will 
hand to the governance advisor. Okay, so we're voting on the substantive motions, which are um, up on the screen. Um, Councillor Darby. Four. Councillor Bartley. Four. Councillor Casey. Yes. Deputy Mayor. Aye. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Coombe. Aye. Councillor Cooper. Aye. Councillor Dalton. Four. Councillor Filipina. Four. Councillor Fletcher. No. Mayor Goff. Four. Councillor Henderson. Yeah. Councillor Hills. Yes, thank you. Councillor Mulholland. Four. Member Namine. Four. Councillor Sayers. Councillor Sayers, are you online? Okay. Councillor Simpson. Okay. Councillor Stewart? No. Councillor Walker? Councillor Walker, your vote. I wish to record my vote against D3. And for the rest of the motion? Sure. Okay. All right. Councillor Watson? No. Councillor Young. Could you just check um, Councillor Walker, please? I, th I thought he said against, you asked a question about against the rest of the motion. Can you just check? Yeah. So Councillor Walker, just to confirm, we had you against cl Clause D, subclause 3, and for the rest of the motion. So, I said I was opposed to Clause D3. Yes. yes. And against the, uh, and for the rest of the motion? Yes. Yes. Just a point of order, just on the vote. Oh, Councillor Sayers has just messaged me to say he's trying to get through. He can't, but he wants to vote against it. I don't know if that's within order or not. But okay, yeah, I'll, um, I th I'll, we're in the middle of a vote. I can't interrupt. I need to take the call of the government's um, advisor. I will confirm with Councillor Sayers after this because I don't think it's going to change the outcome, and we can record it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Decision. Yeah. Decision. Uh, the motions are carried, and they carried 17 votes to three. Thank you, members. Members, um, we've got a little bit of business to go. I don't think it will take us long, but we need a break. So um, ca can I be assured, or can we be assured, of a quorum after a 10-minute break? OK, can um, members... Thank you, Councillor Collins. Yeah. Uh, can I just get a show of hands for a quorum after a 10 minute break, please? Okay, I think I've got enough hands. Thank you. We're back in 10 minutes, so we stand adjourned. And um, 5.20, please.